Well, good morning, everyone. And a uh, really warm welcome to uh, Great Victoria Street Baptist Church this morning. Uh, whether you are just visiting us this morning or you're a regular amongst us, you are really, really welcome. It is great to be together again to worship uh, the Lord and look to him. A few uh, special welcomes to mention this morning. First of all, a really warm welcome to Johnny McLaughlin. Um, he's going to be speaking for us uh, later this morning. Very well known to many of us, a pastor at Hamilton Road in Bangor and also principal of the Irish Baptist College. So we're looking forward to um, hearing from him and it's great to have you with us, uh, Johnny. Also, uh, a special welcome to the team from Belfast Student International Outreach who are with us uh, this morning too. They're going to be running a number of different um, outreach events really uh, over the next few weeks uh, in international cafes, Bible studies and the like. So it is really great to have you with us um, this morning and we're going to be praying for you ahead of your week a little bit later on too. That also flows into the first of our announcements uh, this morning. You'll find all the details uh, coming up in the bulletin. Hopefully you got one of these as you came in. Let me just mention a number of things. First of all, as I say, linked to the um, international outreach team here, we're actually going to be hosting the whole team uh, next Sunday morning. Um, so uh, we are going to be doing a kind of international flavoured service, as it were. We're going to have some songs some readings, some prayers in all kinds of different languages as we rejoice and remember that our God is a God of the nations and that his good news is good news uh, for all. So that's going to be next Sunday uh, morning. And as part of that, as I mentioned last week, we're also going to be hosting a lunch for that team and hopefully also for students who will be uh, joining them. So uh, we could really do with some help and involvement from you guys in making that happen if possible. There are two sign-up sheets at the back. The first is if you are able to provide either a salad or a dessert or tray bake of some sort for that lunch, uh, do just bring that next Sunday. Uh, you can pop your name down um, there. Then the team would also love to invite a number of people just to stay around afterwards. First of all, to serve the food, but then also just to sit with the team, to hear about all that they've been doing as they've been sharing uh, the gospel with the different students that they've been involved with. So if you've not got any plans for next Sunday lunch, love to just invite you to stick around. Put your name down so we know you're going to be here. Stick around, maybe help serve the food, but then also just sit um, and be encouraged, as I'm sure you'll also um, encourage them if you're able to. So there's two sign-up sheets. Do put your uh, name down for those. Then let me just mention lunch plans for today. Uh, after, straight away after this morning service, we have our church picnic. And right now, it is looking like we're going to get to go outside, which is exciting for us. We haven't done that for a few years. Um, so we're going to be heading at pretty much straight after the service over to Malone House, which is just up from Shaw's Bridge. Um, we're going to enjoy lunch, just chat together, maybe enjoy some games together as well. Um, if you're here this morning and hadn't planned already to come, first of all, I know everybody always comes with more than enough food for these kind of things. So do, uh, do just talk to somebody around you. I'm sure they will have food. Come join us. There's also shops that you can head to on the way. And if you're also here and you're, you hadn't been planning ahead or you hadn't, didn't know about going along and you think you'd like a lift, again, there will be loads of cars heading. So talk to somebody next to you, come talk to myself, and we'll get you arranged so you can come and just enjoy that time together. It's always just so valuable. This is part of us being together as a church, just to enjoy time together, talk to each other, hear about each other's lives, um, and have lots of fun. So do, um, do come along straight after the service if you're able to. Uh, later this evening, we have our uh, service um, in First Thessalonians as we continue um, our series there. And it's great to have Michael Crow uh, coming to speak for us um, as we think about how is it that as Christians we can stand firm, particularly amongst life's difficulties and persecutions that might come our way. So do join us this uh, Sunday evening if you're able to. Uh, Wednesday uh, is our final small group uh, of the year, so if you're a part of those, do head along to that. And then the final thing just for me to mention now is our 20s and 30s uh, night away, which is happening at the end of September. Hopefully, lots of you in that group will already have had a message in our WhatsApp group, but if you're not on that group uh, or you'd like to know more, come and chat with myself or Sharon um, afterwards and just encourage you. Uh, if you're able to come, we would really, really uh, love to have a good group to go to that Always a great time of teaching. Again, fellowship, fun. Um, so just uh, maybe on that WhatsApp group, if you're able to just express your interest, that helps us to make plans. Um, or again, if you want more information, do come and uh, talk to me as well. 
Uh, final announcement, just more in terms of practicalities. Unfortunately, this morning, uh, there has been a burst water main, apparently, just down the road here, so we have no water. Uh, so uh, that's just really to say, if you can limit as much as you can, any trips that you might need to a bathroom or just to turn the taps on, whatever it is this morning, again, a good reason to head on quickly to the church picnic and maybe use of some facilities um, on the way. So that's the, that's the final announcement. Um, but let's... Let's calm our hearts now as we turn to our call to worship and remember what it is that we are doing as we meet together this morning. And for our call to worship, uh, I want to read some verses that often we would associate as Christmas verses. We'd hear them around that time of year. But these verses point us at any time of the year to who Jesus is and what it is that he came to do for us. These verses are from Matthew chapter 1 verses 21 to 23, and they say this, the angel speaking to Joseph about what's to happen. She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. This is the wondrous mystery of the gospel that we are rejoicing together again in this morning. God's own son became a man, came to dwell with us, came to save us. And we're going to pick up on those uh, thoughts as we sing our opening two songs. Come behold the wondrous mystery and great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together.
Father, we come before you together now and we praise you once again this morning for who you are. You are a holy, righteous, good and gracious God. Truly, there is none like you. As we've just been singing, there is no shadow of turning with you. You change not. Your compassions, they fail not. As you have been, you forever will be. Lord, what a rock of stability, of hope, of peace you are. And so we come and bow down in worship of you this morning. And we come in worship of you this morning, not just because of who you are, but also because we know exactly what we are like too. Where you are always holy, we are not. Where you are always good, we are not. And yet, despite that, Lord, as we've also just been singing, although we were in darkness, you sent your own son, the light of life, into our world. A wondrous mystery that you sent your son to save otherwise hell-bound men and women like us to die on the tree in our place. Remembering this saving work of Christ again this morning, Lord, we confess our sin to you. We repent of it, we turn from it, and we look again to Christ. We seek forgiveness at the cross. And remember that there he drank the cup of your wrath that should rightly have been ours to drink. Thank you, Lord God, that with you there is forgiveness. And that this morning we can know pardon for sin and a peace that endures. And even right now know your presence with us to cheer and to guide. Would we once again this morning find rest and peace and all that we need in you. As we come this morning and lift our praise to you for your grace, your mercy, we want to also pray for those in our city who do not know that rest, that peace that comes from knowing sins forgiven. Please Lord work in our city to bring more and more to a saving knowledge of your son. And in that way, we do pray particularly this morning for the work of Belfast Student International Outreach. Lord, we thank you for them. Please bless their work this week as they go out and run these cafes, do Bible studies, and just generally look to get speaking to international students in our city about Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you are in many ways bringing the nations here to us in Belfast. 
please would you work in the lives of those even just right now arriving in this city for the first time. Please would many come into contact with the team from BSIO. Would they feel welcomed? And even for the first time, Lord, would they hear? And we pray then respond as they hear the good news of the gospel. Lord, give the team great unity, friendship, and a real sense of joy as they do your work this week and next. And so now, Lord, as we continue our time together, we do thank you once again that that as we meet now, you are here with us. Spirit, please move amongst us, stir our hearts, renew our joy, encourage us, build us up and strengthen us that we would go out from here, each of us, ready to love and serve you with all that we have in the week ahead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, sneaking in just at the start of the service, I'd like to also welcome Lydia Cardwell uh, at the back there. Uh, Congratulations to Jason and to uh, Jenna. Do make sure you go speak with them um, at the end as well. And link to that uh, welcoming in. We're also this morning going to welcome in uh, some new members. On Wednesday night, seven new members were voted in uh, to the membership of the church. And the three of them who are here with us are going to come up. If I can invite Rachel, David, and Manuel to just... Make your way up here. That would be great. We're going to officially uh, welcome them in now. As they do make their way up, it's always a good reminder, isn't it, to speak a little bit about church membership. We always speak of church membership as this two-way thing, don't we? This two-way commitment. Yes, these three here are committing themselves to us, but we also are committing ourselves to them, to serve them, to build them up, to point them to Christ as well. I know Rachel, uh, David and Manuel have been with us for quite a while now. Um, and many of us have already got to know you. You've been a great encouragement uh, to us. But there may be some of us here who, who haven't got to know um, them yet. So just encourage you, maybe even after the service, do uh, take the opportunity. Go and say hi, introduce yourself, um, and just look to encourage them, as I know they will encourage you too. So, Rachel, David, Manuel, it is great to officially... Uh, welcome you um, into the membership of the church. As I said, you have already been such a great encouragement, great blessing to us. And we pray that as you come into membership, the Lord will just continue to do his work in your lives. And you will also just continue to encourage us too. So it's great. Let us pray together for these three um, and for all of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for Rachel, for David and for Manuel. Lord, we thank you for your work in their lives. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that as they've come into membership for us to hear of how you have worked in them, how you've brought them to this place of knowing and trusting in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the blessing of bringing them here to us at Great Vic. As they formally come into membership now, Lord, help each of us here to be ready to serve and to love them and guide them to and use them for your glory amongst us. And we ask that as the Apostle Paul prayed, Rachel, David, and Manuel would, according to the riches of your glory, be strengthened with power through your spirit in their inner being, so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they, being rooted and grounded in love, may each day have strength to comprehend with all the saints what's the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled, Lord, with the fullness of God. Lord, we ask that for them, and we ask that for all of us here this morning too. Lord, thank you that you are a God who loves us more than we can even begin to imagine, and we rest and give you thanks for that once again now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to turn to our Bible reading for this morning now, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3. That's the passage that Johnny's going to be uh, reading for us a little bit, uh, speaking for us uh, from a little bit later on. Um, And Aaron is going to come and read that for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Thanks, Aaron. A time for everything. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. 
a time to, uh, to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man and to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time and also, also he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better uh, for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people uh, fear before him. That which is already has been that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Thank you very much for reading that, Aaron. Well, with the school year coming to a close, uh, we're going to take a moment in the service now just to focus on Sunday school and also on crash to give thanks for the many children that we have um, amongst us, um, and we're going to pray for them shortly. But before that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Judy, uh, to Derek, and to the older Sunday school, I believe, who are going to come up to the front and uh, teach us a song that they have been uh, singing recently. So over to you guys. have been learning over the last few weeks uh, a song that teaches us the, the books of the Old Testament. So we thought, right, we're going to teach it uh, to all of you as well uh, and give you the chance to sing it. So this is a song, for anybody who has kids or grandkids, uh, it's a song by Slugs and Bugs from their Bible songs. Uh, it's a great resource for, for, for kids to listen to. So this is the books of the Old Testament. If you listen to us singing it first time, then please join in the second time, and then we're going to do it a third time when you've got the chance to see if you can impress us. <laughs> okay? And what we'll do is, if anybody doesn't sing, we might bring them up to do it on their own. Oh, what, what about that? So, are we ready, guys? Yeah. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Sing it with us. Oh, we're we'll not doing it this time. We'll just go straight into Genesis. Okay, here we go.
give them a chance to go on their own, you've got to watch carefully. And if anybody's not singing, I want to know, okay? Are you ready, guys? I want to hear a bit louder this time. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Sunday school caters from um, for primary school age kids. Good man, Ryan. Caters for primary school age kids, um, and we have three wonderful P7s on the stage here who have reached the end of Sunday school and come September will be moving on to our youth and um, the new youth ministry that will be starting in September. So I wanted to just acknowledge how wonderful these three are. This is Ryan. Jeffon and Imogen, introduce them to the congregation um, and just really encourage you to be preferably um, supporting them and welcoming them into the congregation as they have more uh, opportunities to serve um, and be a part of the church and just pray for them as they transition from primary school um, onto their new schools um, and onto youth here as well. Um, so we have a little token of our um, thanks to them for how wonderful they've been and as uh, so we leave in present for Imogen, Jeffon and Ryan. Um, and there's one other, um, Elliot Auld, who isn't here today as well, is also P7 and he'll be leaving us. So I've got a, a gift for him. Um, so I just wanted to introduce them to yourselves um, and just thank you, but all three of you, for, um, for how wonderful you've been. We'll really miss all the jokes and fun and all our great conversations we, we have, but we're really excited for you as you journey into, into youth here. So I want to take the opportunity to just pray for, for them, um, just as they're on the stage here. So if you wouldn't mind praying with me. Father, we thank you so much for um, the ministries we have in this church and the ability that we have to meet together um, with the children in our church week in and week out. Um, we thank you for, um, for Ryan, for Imogen, for Jeffron and for Elliot, um, for the contributions they have made to Sunday School, um, for the many times of joy and laughter and good conversations and discussion we've had with them um, over the past few years, um, or for some for many years that they've been coming to our Sunday School. And we pray for them as they transition into new schools um, and into the youth ministry here, Lord, that you would grow them in their faith um, and just really bring out their gifts and talents um, and their character in that. And we pray, Father, for them um, just for continued guidance um, and blessings in their life and that you would be close to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You can take a seat. Um, just as the kids are sitting, I have one more announcement. It's maybe a little bit more of a, of a plea um, for support from the congregation. Um, we have a team of very dedicated volunteers for our Sunday school ministry, and we really want to give them a chance to have a bit of a break over the summer months of July and August. Um, so we're going to be finalising a summer rota. Um, over the, the next week that will cover July and August. And we need a few more volunteers um, to put their names down to support. Um, it will just be one um, Sunday morning during those two months. So if you're a member and you're interested in kids' ministry and you're willing to give us just one Sunday morning, please speak to myself or Joanne um, today, um, and we'd love to have you join us. We'll provide all of the resources and materials that you need, um, and it's just great to be able to keep that Sunday school running through the summer. Thank you. So much, Judy. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you to the older Sunday school. That was very, uh, really, really impressive. We're going to have that 
jingle running through our heads, I think, for the rest of uh, today, too. Just before they go out, I think it would be great for us just to pray more generally for uh, the children in our church. Give thanks uh, for them. It is such a great joy, isn't it, to see them coming along week by week, hearing um, the word, and just the the fun and the laughter that they bring for us. So let's pray together uh, for them. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for all of the children in our church family here. Lord, we are so grateful to you for their lives, for their families. Lord, we ask that you would each and every one of them be working and blessing them, feeding them, stirring them up to love you as a result of being amongst us. Lord, we thank you so much for the children's time that they spend in Sunday school each week. And we think also of Crash this morning too. Lord, we thank you, Father, that once again this year, the children have been faithfully taught the good news, what it means to live in light of it and to be a follower of yours. We once again pray that you would reveal yourself to each and every one, and we ask that they would all seek that forgiveness that you offer in Christ and that they would have a real, joyful, living, daily relationship with you. Lord, we pray for protection from the world and the devil's lies, and we ask that your truth would shine brighter to them. And that they would be a light for Jesus in their schools, in their clubs, in their friendship groups, and in their families. Lord, we take this opportunity to thank you also for the faithful work of our Sunday school and crash leaders as we've just been thinking about. We, Lord, we thank you for their sacrificial service week by week and for their love for each one of these children here. We pray that as we do look to the summer, you would give them some time of refreshment, renewal, and that they would be ready to come back and continue their work next year. We pray that you would fill them with all that they would need in order to do the good works that you've prepared for them to do here amongst us. And now, Lord, as the children uh, look to go out to their groups, and we in a moment turn to your word here together as well, we pray that you would just continue your work of revealing yourself and your truth to us, whether we're young or we're old. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it has been great to have the children with us. Um, As usual, this is the part of the service where they are going to head out to their different groups. So the older group from the front doors here, those younger or in creche age via the back. Um, And why don't we take this opportunity just to turn and to say hi to somebody who's sat nearby. Well, uh, hopefully uh, there'll be lots of time at the end of the service to pick up those conversations. Um, As I say, either here in the building or if you're able to join us uh, for the church picnic, that would be great. But I'm going to take the opportunity now just to turn and uh, talk a little bit with uh, Johnny McLaughlin, who has mentioned uh, president of the Irish Baptist College. Uh, Johnny's going to come up here, we're going to talk a little bit, and then he's going to uh, bring God's word uh, for us. So, Johnny, it's always good just at this point to hear a little bit about who you are. Some of us know you a bit more, some of us don't. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am Johnny. I am married to Jenny and I have my family with me today. So there's Jensen's here and Jonah's here and Maisie is here as well. Also, we've got a wee friend. Okay. My dad? No, he's not. He's in Bangor at the moment. So (laughs) we keep him away for a little while. So yeah. So live in Bangor. We've been there since uh, 2010. So um, I was also there as a boy when my dad was pastor at Hamilton Road. So we've really been at Hamilton Road the guts of 22 years of our life. So 
I haven't got rid of us just yet, Simon. Very good. Well, there's, you, you have taken on something else in your life, though, as I've mentioned yeah. about the Irish Baptist College. Tell us yeah. a little bit about your role there, how that's come about, and what you're doing. Yeah, so from the 1st of September, I also took on uh, what they call principal designate of the Irish Baptist College. So I've been learning the ropes from our outgoing president. Uh, well, he's now the president of the association, our outgoing principal, uh, who's been teaching me a lot over the last uh, couple of semesters. So, yeah, it's quite a bit to juggle, uh, but the Lord's been really good over the last year, just helping us think through the different things we need to do. So it's been a new venture for me, trying to learn uh, academics from the other side of the table. Uh, like yourself, Simon, you spend a lot of years at Bible College, the other side of the table, mm -hmm. and now you're trying to set assignments rather than do assignments. Um, so, no, the Lord's been very good, just helping me think through um, the future of the college and where God would lead us and guide us. That's great. It's really exciting. Um, so, yes, we're, we're sitting here this morning, and I guess it's a great opportunity just to hear a bit more from you about the college. Uh, maybe, maybe some of us know of it, maybe some of us don't at all. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about it, what it's seeking to do, and maybe just encourage what would it look like for somebody here to, to get involved, maybe get enrolled or do something uh, linked to the college. Yeah, well, the college has been around for quite some time. It was originally founded in Dublin, and if some of you follow us on our social media, you'll see we've actually just launched a hub in Dublin, kind of returning to its ancient roots. And one interesting fact is if uh, lots of Baptist people know uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and uh, actually Spurgeon's grandson was the principal of the Irish Baptist College for 42 years. So there's kind of a little bit of interesting history yeah. when it was in Dublin. And then it moved up to uh, East Belfast, and then it moved to Moira about 20 years ago. So the Lord's been good, keeping it alive through world wars and all sorts of challenges here mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. So the Lord has raised up a lot of men and women who've gone out into gospel service for, well, uh, quite, quite some time. So there's lots of courses available. What I love to say to everybody is that there's a course for anybody. And some people say, oh, well, I'm not a theologian. And I love to challenge people to go, well, everyone's a theologian because theology is just the study of God. And the more we study God, the more we understand him. And then I think the more we love him. And the late R.C. Sproul wrote a book called Everyone's a Theologian. Mm -hmm. And so no matter who you are this morning, we all need to be growing in our understanding of the Lord Jesus. And I find that for me personally, when I'm kind of encouraged slash forced to do it in a classroom environment, it keeps me going and it keeps me on track. Mm -hmm. And so you might be here saying I, I, I'm working and I could only maybe give, maybe give up one night a week. So we have Monday night classes in a couple of different locations. The closest one for you here would probably be Moira. And that kind of runs in five week blocks. So you might say, I only could commit for five weeks, but you could take a module for five weeks. Or there might be somebody here saying, well, I'm in a job, but I'd love to do a master's. And you could give up a couple of weeks a year and be part of our master's program. Or there might be somebody saying, you know, I'm starting out in life, or maybe I've just entered retirement early and I want to study full time. You come to the Baptist College 24 weeks a year and get fully immersed in our um, preparation for ministry degree. That's great. It is really encouraging just to hear all that the college is offering. Um, and as part of the association, we really do want to support and encourage um, you guys as well and so we'll be praying for you in just a moment too uh, I guess any final words of encouragement then for us as we sit up think here about the college or, or anything else from from yourself um, our director of training Davy Ellison again if you follow us on social media we'll see he did a video called it takes 10 years to make a pastor mm -hmm. and obviously ultimately we believe only God makes a pastor ultimately but if if you have someone called of God it takes the guts of 10 years to get them through theological education, to get them through assistantships, to really have them in a place where they'll be ready to take on more and more responsibility. So sometimes churches think, well, we're okay. We've got great pastors like Simon and Steve, but who's going to be your pastor in 40 years time? Because Simon, you may not, you may still be here, but you also may not be. <laughs> that, that would be a life sentence. It's quite a scary, uh, it's quite a scary thought. Yeah. But yes, no, so yeah. some maybe all of us in life think about what's it, what's happening tomorrow because mm -hmm. my life's crazy and churches can be like that too to go but but if we're going to protect the church for the generations to come we need to be training men and women now so that they can take up the baton in their day and generation that's great well we can think on that and maybe some more things to even talk about at our church picnic which you know is coming up so um let's uh, let's turn let's pray together um, for the college, and then we'll pray for Johnny as he comes to bring uh, God's word to us. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much that we do have good news uh, to share. And Lord, we thank you for um, the work of Irish uh, Baptist College. We thank you so much for its history, its rich history of training up people to go and proclaim that good news. Lord, we uh, thank you that right now there are uh, many faithful men and women who are serving, who are training in the college. Lord, we pray for those who even right now are, are setting out on that journey. Lord, please equip them, uh, encourage them, build them up, that they would be faithful teachers um, of your word, that it would point many people to Christ. Lord, we thank you for Johnny. We thank you for his uh, taking up this role recently. Lord, Lord, we pray for your blessing and encouragement for him as he juggles that and his church as well. And Lord, we just thank you uh, so much for his desire. Lord, we see it here, his desire to just see more and more people trained up uh, and taught so that they can just faithfully go uh, and preach your word. And so Lord, I just please encourage him, help him as he just continues to think through the direction of the college as it goes forward. And Lord, we, uh, we do pray for all of us here. Lord, if there, is, there are some of us uh, here who, who would really benefit, who would get so much out of being a part of one of these courses, whether it's full-time or just one of those evening courses, Lord, help us to think that through really well. We thank you for that encouragement that Johnny's brought, that, that all of us are theologians, Lord, because we are uh, studying you. We look to you. We want to know more of who you are. We want to know more of your grace. So Lord, would this be a real uh, encouragement even for us as we uh, think that through more and more in our lives? And Lord, we thank you for Johnny. We thank you for his uh, faithful ministry for so many years in, in teaching and preaching your word. And we thank you for the blessing of him coming to do that amongst us uh, this morning too. Lord, we, we pray he would feel really welcome um, and encouraged and supported as he comes to bring your word. Uh, and Lord, we ask now that as we open this chapter from the book of Ecclesiastes, you would speak to us. Lord, would it be a light uh, to our path, a lamp to our feet? Would it, would it encourage us? Would it point us to Christ? Um, Lord, we thank you that your word is living and active. We pray that it would bear much fruit amongst us as Johnny brings it to us now. Lord, we thank you that you are a good and gracious God who reveals yourself to us. Please encourage us and build us up now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. Hand over to you. Well, thank you to Simon for the very warm welcome. It's great uh, to be with you and to open up God's Word uh, as we look at this interesting book, the book of Ecclesiastes. And if we're just going to dip into it for a few moments this morning, I want to ask you a question as we open up Ecclesiastes chapter 3 together. Have you ever asked yourself this, what is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of of my life. Why am I here? Where am I going? Where is this world going? And in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think it's King Solomon. Now, there's lots of debate. If you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, it speaks of the Kaheleth, the teacher of Israel, the preacher of Israel, who's giving instructions, who's giving wisdom to the coming generations about the purpose and the significance of their lives. I believe there's lots of debate, but with significant evidence that it was Solomon. Solomon was one of the wisest men ever to live. It was given to him by God, God-given wisdom and instruction. But I think towards the end of his life, he's looking back down the corridors of time. He's assessing memory lane. He's rewinding the DVD, and he's asking himself the question, what has been the purpose of my life? And so he asks that question of himself. He wants to help answer the coming generations about what the purpose of their life might look like. He wants them to follow God. He wants them to have their purpose and their identity in God. And he doesn't want the coming generations to make the same mistakes that he had. He's trying to find significance in, in women, in wine, in wealth, in philosophy, in politics, in education, in all sorts of factors and facets of life, he sought to find true satisfaction. And he says in chapter 1, it was meaningless. 
unless God was at the center. And that's a great temptation for you this morning, maybe as you anticipate the life that lies ahead of you, or maybe some of you, you've only got a little bit of life left to live for God. And you say, how am I going to live it? Solomon would encourage us to put God at the center. But in these few moments that we have, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and let's, let's look at this fact that he says, for us this morning, there's a season for everything. Or there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything in the course of our lives. In contrast to lots of errant reflections on life, Solomon says that we need to consider God as the center of our lives. And we see that all across the Scripture. I'll just read a few verses to you. Psalm 140, speaking of God, knowing the times and seasons of our lives, said this, He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for its setting. Or Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Or the words of the psalmist in Psalm 31, verse 15, the psalmist says, my times are in your hands. And so as Solomon helps us think through this morning, the purpose of our life, he wants us to embrace the fact that as we look down the corridors of time, or we look forward into the days that lie ahead of us, our times are in God's hands. And while this book is so focused on his reflections, I think he ultimately wants us to look above the sun to the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars and who set them in place. I think he wants to, us to, to look forward to one who would come from above the sun and live life under the sun, who would indeed be God's one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this book, from start to finish, leaves us thirsting for Jesus to find our satisfaction, to find our significance, to find our success, not in ourselves, but in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a season for everything. We don't have lots of time to spend this morning, but verses 1 to 8, Solomon uses poetry to communicate there being a time or a season for everything. Then verses 9 to 15, he uses prose, more didactic literature to further expand on some of the implications that he sets out in verses 1 to 8. You'll see it across these 14 lines. He uses the word time 28 times. Solomon, I think, is making clear that God alone is the one who determines our seasons and our times, that God is the primary, albeit implicit actor here through the ever-constant swings of time, but life being held firmly in God's hands. So, as we consider there being a season for everything, look at the first major movement in the text. Look at the first point that we all have personal seasons, verses 1 to 8. We all have personal seasons, verses 1 to 8. Look at what it says, verse 1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Now, I had a difficulty with this just a few weeks ago. It was our church weekend, and my wife was packing for the weekend, and she packed what I would say quite uh, largely. There was quite a large bag that was going to us. And so I was saying, you know, Jen, why are you packing such a large bag? She says, well, as you know, as we go to this church weekend, we've got to pack for every season. You know what that's like living in Northern Ireland? Could be winter in the morning, summer in the afternoon, and like spring at night. And yet when we look at the seasons of life and the movement across a year, Solomon says there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. Spring turns into summer, summer into autumn, and autumn into winter. We go through seasons of our life. We go from infancy to adolescence to our teens to our young adulthood to our middle age years, and maybe even some of us to our senior years, and maybe even to a small fraction of us into our golden twilight years, and then into eternity. Solomon says there's a season for everything. 
and he doesn't want to be fatalistic. No, the preacher, the teacher, Solomon has come to a proper appreciation of the sovereignty of God over our life and over time and over eternity. And he wants us to see the one who lives above the sky as we live under heaven. He wants us to see that God is the king of time. He wants us to see that God is regulating our minutes and our seconds. He's ruling our moments and our days, that nothing happens in our lives without the superintendence of a sovereign God. He also wants us to see that God is the God of order, that God's sovereignty has chronology, evident from the very beginning of time when God divided the days of creation. We see it in every change of season and the turning of summer into autumn and the coming of springtime after winter, that God is the king of time and that God is a God of order. And he does everything at the right time. There's a season for everything. But Solomon gets very reflective here and he kind of goes through the whole gambit of life. Look at verse two. He says, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die both the cradle and the deathbed are under God's sovereign timetable. The psalmist reflected about the days when we're born, Psalm 139, verse 13, for you, O God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. But yet the Bible also speaks of the time of our death, Hebrews 9, 27, just as a man is destined to die once, and then after that, to face the judgment. Solomon says, under the sovereignty of God, who controls our times and our seasons and orders the days of our life, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And as a pastor at the Ulster Hospital, I've had some incredible moments where I've gone to visit a little baby that's been born at the maternity ward. And I've walked to the far side of the hospital to the care for the elderly, where one of our members is about to go into the arms of the Lord. This is our life under the sun. But what about the world of farming? Well, look at Solomon says in verse 2, he says, there's a time to plant and there's a time to uproot. He then goes on to the world of conflict. He says, verse 3, there's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. He says, there's a time to tear down and there's a time to to build. Now, I don't think he's trying to make a sort of justification of what is or is not a just war. I think he's just saying this is reality. You know, there's a couple of major conflicts across our world at the moment, and when you see one nation fighting against the other, what they do is they destroy a nation in order to win over that nation, and then when they get into that new nation and they take over it, that which they've knocked down, they try to build up again. Solomon says this is some of the mystery of life under God's sovereign care. There's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and there's a time to build. But he moves from the world of farming and the conflict, and then he looks at the world of joy and sorrow. He looks at the emotional world that we live in. Look at verse 4. He says, there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Again, as a minister, you get the full orbit of life. When a new baby is born, you're, you're, you're wonderfully happy that this little child has been brought into the church family, as you've experienced this past week, a new baby's been born into the church community. And yet, you've, you, you've sat here when, when you've been at a funeral, and you've been sad, and yet you've been given thanks for the life of someone you've loved in this church community. This is the whole orbit and gambit of life. And the wonderful thing is, if that's the season that you're in at the moment, the Lord Jesus knows those seasons himself. He knew very well the truth of this verse as he wept at the tomb of Lazarus, his precious friend. Shed tears as he looked over to Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would love to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. And so he felt deep emotional struggles in his life. And yet he knew the joy of being part of a family experiencing new family members in his own community. He experienced great times of joy and sorrow himself. But Solomon keeps moving. He says, verse 5, there's a time to scatter stones, and there's a time to gather them. 
He says there's a time to embrace and there's a time to refrain from embracing. He says there's a time to search. He now looks at the normal frustrations of everyday life. There's a time to search for things like the lost coin and the lost sheep, but there's also a time to give up. There's a time to keep things, and yet there's a time to throw away things. You know that yourself, don't you? Some of you are more at the more senior stages of your life. There was a time when you kind of moved into a bigger house, and you got more and more stuff, and you maybe had family members in your house, and then you got to a stage in life where you thought, we now need to downsize and get rid of all that stuff that we accumulated over the years. There's a time to gather things up, and there's the time to throw things away. But what about times of real difficulty? Solomon reflects on that. Look at verse 7. He says there's a time to tear and there's a time to mend. He says there's a time to be silent and he says there's a time to speak. This may refer to the breach and restoration of relationships which requires discernment and knowing when to speak and when to be silent. It may allude to mournings and funerals and mourners tearing their clothes and comforters keeping silent during times of grief. We think of Job's friends keeping silent for seven days. I think he's just reflecting on how times change. And there's different seasons and there's different activities under heaven as we live under the sun. It's like Solomon is giving us a practical application of living in a Genesis 3 world, where we're living east of Eden, where the flaming swords were going back and forth, and we couldn't get back into the presence of God. And we live in this kind of wilderness-like existence, or as one writer says, having like an orphan spirit, longing to be back in the very presence of God again, and feeling this distant relationship with the Creator and the whole creation all around us, and yet longing for the new heavens and the new earth where moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal, and there'll be no more mourning and no more sighing for the whole old order of this intermediate world that we live in will pass away and he'll make everything new. Solomon is saying, this is what it's like living now, but live for God. This is what it's like now, but live for that world that is to come. Jesus knew the struggles of thinking about when he should speak and when he should be silent. We think of him walking the streets of Jerusalem and around the shores of Galilee. And we read Mark's gospel. Maybe you're not a Christian. You've never read it before. I can encourage you to read Mark's gospel. And when we pick up Mark's gospel, this short biography of the life of Jesus it says of his ministry, the time has come. Jesus said, repent and believe. And yet his disciples had a different timetable to God's. We are a bit like that too, aren't we? You're maybe sitting here frustrated with the season of life that you're in, and you know, God, I've got a very different timetable to you. And in his three-year ministry, so many of the disciples thought, we can arrange the timetable better, Jesus. Remember that great transfiguration account? Let's just stay here. Let's build three tabernacles. But it wasn't the time. Jesus, let's go and march to Jerusalem. Let's overthrow the Romans. Let's seize back political power. It's not the time. It's not the hour. And as Jesus stood before Pilate, the Bible says he was silent like a lamb before its shears. Jesus knew when it was time to preach. And Jesus knew when it was time to be silent. In our personal seasons, we need to be, as Ephesians 5 verse 15 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Let me challenge you, what are you doing with your life? In my role in the Baptist College, that's what we want, to challenge people to think about, what are you doing with your life? As we live between Genesis 3 and Revelation 21 and 22 with the thorns and the thistles and the difficulties and the challenges and seasons coming and seasons going, Ecclesiastes asks us, who are we living for? 
The world says live for yourself. Ecclesiastes encourages us to live for God in our personal season. Secondly, we don't just experience personal seasons, we experience corporate or national seasons. Look at verses 8 and 9. That's our second heading, the corporate seasons of life. Solomon says there's a time to love, and there's a time to hate. He says there's a time for war, and there's a time for peace. Perfect peace will not exist this side of the new heavens and the new earth. And so Solomon arranges this verse chiastically. It's, it's a, po a poetic uh, system that he's using here. There's love and hate. There's war and peace representing personal feelings at the start of verse 8 and then socio-political conditions at the end of verse 8. And God has promised peace on earth, but it won't be until the second coming of the Prince of Peace. We live in a wartime currently. Both in our individual lives, we face the battles of our flesh, the worldly system that we live in and the brokenness of it, the attacks of the enemy. And yet Solomon wants us to say that there's a time for everything and that Christ is the Lord of, of time. That's why we sing crying him with many crowns. That's why we sing Lord of the years, the, the potentate of time, so that even as we fight our own flesh and as we live in a broken worldly system and we experience the fiery darts of the evil one, again, Ecclesiastes points us to look at life over the sun, the one who lives over the sun, that Christ indeed is Lord of time. He's sovereign over all things, even in times of war and times of hate. So why has God done all this? Why has he allowed these things to happen? Well, look at verses 9 and 10. He says, what does the worker gain from all his toil? He says, I have seen the burden God has laid on men. Solomon, I think, is saying that humans are locked into a world of events that we cannot shape. And in these verses, he's applying the poem on time to human toil, and no amount of our own effort can change the times that God has determined. And that when we as a, a corporate body of people or a national group of people experience the challenge of a season of war and hate, it's to point us to God who's going to do something new. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And yet so many people don't consider life above the sun. They just knuckle down and try to sort it out themselves. And yet it's to pry our fingernails off trying to control life ourselves. So what is God doing? Well, I think that leads us to our third point, God's purpose in seasons. We all experience personal seasons. We all experience national or corporate seasons. And so this last thought is, what is God's purpose in the seasons of our lives? Verses 11 to 14. Look at what he says, verse 11. He, being God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He, being God, has made everything beautiful in his time. Time. One writer said this, Solomon enables us to see perpetual change, not as something unsettling, but as an unfolding pattern, scintillating and God-given. This writer said, the trouble for us is not that life refuses to keep still, but that we see only a fraction of its movements and of its subtle, intricate design. Instead of changelessness, there is something better, a dynamic divine purpose with its beginning and end. That God has made everything, therefore, in God's sovereign purposes, everything has its own place and time if we seek His own purpose and will in all things. Let me say this to you. God is always doing so much more in every season of your life than you'll ever understand. God is always, in His sovereign purposes, doing so much more in the season of your life than you will ever see 
or you will ever understand. His ways are beyond our ways. His thoughts loftier than our thoughts. Even the great apostle Paul, who was directed and guided by the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, as he considered God's sovereignty in election in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he got to this place where he said, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable is his judgments. Job simply put his hand over his mouth when he considered the seasons of his life. We have to remember the words also of Peter in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. God's always doing much more in the season of your life than you will ever understand or I think possibly ever know because he is the sovereign one. The Psalm 31 verse 15 says, my times, O God, are in your hands. And you say, is there anyone that can identify with me if I'm in a difficult season or if I'm wondering about the purpose of my life and the direction it's going to go? Is there anybody who'll go with me in life? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ himself knows a little bit about time. Let me just take you on a little journey with him. As God the Father sovereignly orchestrated the sending and timing of his own son's ministry. Galatians 4 verse 4, even at his birth. It says, but when the time had fully come. Some of you are historians and you know a little bit about the background of this verse. It was a time known as Pax Romani. There was peace in those particular times. Then there was great infrastructure. There were roads built by the Romans. So there was political peace. There was great economic prosperity. Roads were being built. But there was also a great gift of linguistics. There were four different types of Greek, from the most intellectual to the most basic. The most basic was Koine Greek. And so as the nations were being conquered and they all spoke different languages, they they came up with Koine Greek. This basic Greek is all the different peoples were being captured as they would fight in battles together. They all needed to speak one language. And what was the message of the New Testament written in? Koine Greek. So that all might understand. It was the right time. So when we read, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full right of sons. But you could understand the people as we were singing the the books of the Bible, and we got the Malachi. It ends in a funeral. And then 400 years of silence between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. If you lived in the intertestamental period, you would have said, God, what sort of a season is this? No more prophecies, no more revelations, no more prophets. God, what are you doing with this season of our personal and corporate lives? God, what are you doing? You've probably asked that question. But it wasn't the time. The Old Testament ends with a death. And the New Testament begins with the birth of a baby. But when the time had fully come, our times, and the Lord Jesus' time was in his hands. And then in his ministry, as we read earlier, Mark 1 verse 14, beginning his ministry, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Speaking to his disciples in John 7 verse 6, therefore Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. And then he gets to the upper room, praying with his father. John 17, 1, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, The time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And then Jesus on the cross, Acts 2.23, Peter preaching, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing to him cross. It's incredible to think that this was God's sovereign purpose and season for his own son to be suspended between heaven and earth on a cross. And you would wonder and question if you were the disciples at the foot of the cross, what is the good for us? And yet God was doing the greatest good the world has ever seen. There's a season for everything because God is in control of our times. 
Think about the time God saved you from your sin. If you're a Christian this morning, Romans 5 verse 6, you see at just the right time. While you were still hopeless, Christless, and purposeless, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. So the Father has our times in his hands. But look at the end of verse 11. He's also done something else. He's also said eternity in the hearts of men. There's a restlessness in us to get back into that Eden-like existence. There's a restlessness to see these new heavens and these new earth, to have that unfiltered joy being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he said eternity deep in our hearts. C.S. Lewis said this, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find a place where all the beauty came from, to have the scent of a flower which I have not yet found, to discover the echo of a tune which I've never heard before, to hear news from a country which I've never visited before. Lewis says that the God has placed something in my heart to experience life over the sun with God. Yet our colleagues and our co-workers and some of our family members experience the end of verse 11, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And so he says, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. He says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. I think Solomon is saying is God allows us to go through the seasons of our lives personally, nationally, and corporately so that we might seek him while he may be found, that they, we might come to him while he is near. And as we look back down these eight lines of poetry, and these five or six lines of teaching, there's one who's experienced them all. The Lord Jesus Christ, born in the midst of war, living in an occupied place, ruled by foreign people, fleeing as a refugee in the midst of conflict, in the middle of the night, seeking asylum in Egypt. He experienced times of great dancing. Luke records him either coming to a meal or, or, coming, or going to a party. We see him in the temple going to worship as a boy and enjoying times in the presence of his father, and yet many years later experiencing great anger and turning over the temples because it's been turned into a den of robbers. We see him weeping as John records at the grave of Lazarus. We see him loving the warm embrace of his disciples through his three years of ministry. We see him experiencing the betrayal of Judas and knowing also there was a time to die. In a sense, the baby born in the manger was born to die. Could I challenge you? Who are you living for? What is the purpose of your life? The book of Ecclesiastes points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we'll find true satisfaction. It points us forward to the new heavens and the new earth and encourages us. Let's live in light of eternity. So let's just take a few moments to pray, and then I'll welcome the team to come up. And let's use this final song in many senses as a prayer. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for the raw honesty of the teacher, Solomon. We thank you for him sharing his wisdom and his perspectives on life. But yet, our Father, we thank you for the full counsel of God as we look from Genesis to Revelation and how it speaks about the different seasons of our lives. 
Lord, we're conscious in a room this size that many people here are experiencing great times of joy. And yet there's people here experiencing real times of struggle. And so, Father, for those in those personal times, would this book, would this passage reorientate them to seek you, the creator of the ends of the earth? And Father, we want to thank you especially that you sent your one and only Son to live life under the sun, to experience temptation and grief and joy and betrayal and hunger and thirst, has experienced so many of the emotions that we have in our lives yet wonderfully without sin. And so, our Father, this morning, help us to look to Jesus. For those of us who are weary and heavy laden, for those of us who just feel worn out and beaten by life, to come to Jesus and to find our satisfaction and our rest in Him. Because it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. us to the Lord Jesus and we're going to look to him as we sing this closing song. Let's stand together.
fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Amen. Do you take a seat.